Good afternoon to you. Mark Sutter with HurricaneTrack.com. Now, normally, this would be the hurricane outlook and discussion, but being that tomorrow is June 1st and the official start of the Atlantic hurricane season, I thought it would be prudent to put together this 2021 Atlantic hurricane season preview for you. We're going to go over a lot. You can see all those tabs I've got open up there. So you might want to listen to this as an audio podcast first and then go back and check out the visuals, the different graphics I'm going to show you because we're going to go over a lot of information to get you ready and aware as to what to expect for the upcoming hurricane season. All right, so let's get started. First of all, ingredients for a busy season. Busy, not busy, active versus inactive. That tells us nothing of impacts. And so please remember that as I talk about this first section here about ingredients, you know, what we look for, the different forecasts, that kind of stuff. None of that is going to tell us what's going to happen where you are or where I am here at my house in Wilmington, North Carolina. I don't know. I don't know those answers this far out. You know, a strong tropical storm can come in and blow my fence over and boom, I got to pay five, six grand for a new fence. We can have a category three or four hurricane here in Wilmington. I don't know that. I don't know that. I don't know about where you live. So just keep that in mind that a busy season tells us nothing about what happens right there where you live. All right. So let's just keep it in perspective. So the first thing that people like me keep an eye on are sea surface temperature anomalies. This is one of my favorite tools to understand whether or not the season will be more or less active than we are used to seeing. And the first part of this is the state of the ENSO over here, or El Nino Southern Oscillation. The El Nino, the abnormal warming of the Pacific, that area that I highlighted there, and El Nino usually means a less active Atlantic hurricane season, basically because the warmer water compared to average that we would see during an El Nino creates more upward motion. In the Pacific, that air sinks and spreads out across the Atlantic creating subsidence and wind shear. And those two things are not favorable for tropical waves that are coming across the Atlantic here. They run into that sinking air and wind shear coming from this way, and bam, you have a less active hurricane season. The other part of the puzzle is the Atlantic Basin sea surface temperatures. And they are warmer than average this year. They have been, for the most part, since about 1995, part of this AMO, the Atlantic Multidecadal Oscillation, and that's a whole complex feature in and of itself. But generally speaking, the Atlantic is warmer than average, and that tends to favor more upward motion in the Atlantic, more moisture and humidity for these systems to work with down in the deep tropics, and typically gives us a bigger and more robust season. Added to all that is this information here from the Bureau of Meteorology. I want to cite it right there for you. Way down in Australia, the BOM gives us a really nice way to look at this in the future. So for the month of June coming up, that starts tomorrow, you look at these different models here. The BOM from Bureau of Meteorology to the Canadian CANSIPS, the Euro, the JMA, the Meteo France, the NOAA CFS, the UK MET model, and then the all-important mean. You remember that from school? You know how they said, am I ever going to use this math? Well, yes, you will. You know, averages or means, this is very important. So right down the middle is your ENSO neutral. Right down the middle. This is warmer on the right-hand side. This is colder towards La Nina on the left. And then these are all of your different model outputs and what they're thinking, so to speak, for the month of June. And the mean right here, the average, is slightly cooler. Let's erase that and start over. Slightly cooler than neutral. See that? So if we move to July and we poll the models, it kind of contracts just a little bit. Everything kind of shrinks towards zero there. So it's almost dead neutral for July. But by August, look what happens. September, October. More and more of these models here leaning towards the cool side, except for the JMA, the cool side of neutral. And the, uh, the mean, the average there, is definitely cold neutral. Now, not dipping quite far enough into La Nina yet, but that's not necessarily needed for it to be a very active season. 
and give us trouble. And that's what we're looking for at the end of the day, right? We want to know, when is trouble going to head my way? And again, I said earlier, I can't tell you that. But what I can tell you, looking at this, looking back at the sea surface temperature charts, it looks like that those basic ingredients are in place. The absence of El Nino, that is a positive. The warm Atlantic, that's a positive, should give us an overall busy season. Now we add to it the upward motion information here, and this is from Ben Knoll. I follow Ben. I talk about Ben often. He's down in New Zealand at the National Institute of Water and Atmospheric Research. He has appeared on some of my Hurricane U, Hurricane University videos on YouTube, and we trust Ben. Ben's good. Ben puts together great maps, these thematic maps. What does it show? The green versus the red. I figured out a really easy way to explain this to you. The green area in the tropics represents that upward motion over a large scale. Think about what we're looking at there in that map. Let me get rid of me so you can see it better. This map is the whole world stretched out flat. Maybe that's where people thought that the world was flat because they keep seeing flat maps. Ha ha ha. Anyway, this is a Mercator projection map. It shows you the whole globe stretched out into a rectangle. So it's hard to get a sense of scale, but this is a giant area of green, of upward motion in the atmosphere. That is a cyclone factory, especially over the tropics, in, in which case they're called tropical cyclones. So think of that when you think of these green areas. Those are hurricane factories. And remember, what did we see this month over the Indian Ocean? Bang the table there. And the Bay of Bengal. We saw a couple of tropical cyclones form while we had that favorable area there. So it very much makes sense. Now let's move out to the month of June. That's coming up. It shifts. This gets shut down. And now the Atlantic, Africa, Eastern Pacific becomes favorable with more upward motion. So we might have uh, a busy June coming up. Who knows? We'll have to wait and see. Nobody knows the future for sure. But this upward motion pattern favors a busy June. And July, same kind of thing. But this is really important. We start to favor Africa with the upward motion in the month of July, creating that upward motion, those tropical waves, those robust waves of low pressure and moisture and energy, a little bit of a shift of wind with them, a convergent zone. Seedlings, that's the word. It is a seedling factory. And it is centered, the green area, over Africa when? In the month of July. Also the month of August. Also the month of September. And also into the month of October. And what will happen is these tropical waves come out of this factory here and head out into the Atlantic. And it really then becomes of a matter of, again, this is the macro, this large map. You're looking at the whole world there. These tropical waves come out. It's hard to know the micro scale environment that a system can come across, maybe falter a little bit due to some shear and dry air, and then it comes to life over just a two to three day period close to the islands, maybe close to Cuba. You know, it's an island, but I'm just saying you get the idea. Florida, the East Coast, the Gulf, we don't know those details yet. This part is the big puzzle piece that says thumbs up for a positive influence on the hurricane season to provide ample opportunities for development from our hurricane factories there. Just rewind it a little bit. There's May, June, July, August, September, and October. The European model there favoring a strong upward motion pattern coupled with these negative INSO, no El Nino, warm Atlantic. The models generally agreeing, as I showed you, that will be on a cool neutral for the ENSO regions, it looks like a busy hurricane season ahead. So there's the end of that graphic and that first concept. Let's kill some of these slides here. All right, so what does that mean? Well, NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, puts out seasonal forecasts just like a lot of different places do. University of Arizona, Colorado State, NC State. There's private organizations. Um, the Weather Channel does one, AccuWeather. Weather Bell, numerous other people, even some individuals, some different students put out their own forecast as well. A lot of people doing it. And this graphic is really cool. And by the way, I want to give credit where credit is due. 
The concept for this graphic was by Tomer Berg, who is at the University of Oklahoma, I do believe, and our own graphic guy, his name is Tim Melman, reinterpret it for my use here. So special um, credit there. Again, where credit is due that Tomer Berg came up with the idea. What does it show? Well, this shows over the last several years, going back to 2007, the NOAA track record. And all in all, if you look at the way that these are distributed, their forecasts have more or less hit the mark pretty well. You know, there's a few exceptions. You know, these are the actual over here. So they were forecasting, for example, in 07, this range of activity, and the verification was right in the middle, so they did pretty good. In 2008, it was just on the upper end. 2010, uh, 09 will skip. I'm just moving along. 2010, they forecast a, a higher end range. They were kind of in the middle. Last year, kind of missed out. You know, the May forecast was for just under 20 named storms. We ended up with 30. But the amount of hurricanes, generally speaking, they've done a really good job with major hurricanes. Some years better than others, but the bottom line, everybody with a solid reputation that does this where they verify and they scientifically review everything. I mean, anybody can just say, oh, I think there's going to be 14, 9, and 4, or whatever. I'm just saying these agencies, NOAA, the, the, the Colorado State, University of Arizona, NC State, that keep a record and go back and verify and learn from where they might have gone wrong, they're getting better. They really are. And again, this tells us the background state is favorable for a busy season. So for this year, all that being said, we're looking at that range there of anywhere from like 13 to 20 named storms, maybe as many as 10 hurricanes, you never know, and three to five major hurricanes. And overall, the, the track record's pretty good. So let's take note of that going forward that it could be a busy year. So what does that mean for preparedness? Well, I'm going to tell you something. I've been doing this for over 25 years. I've been in a lot of hurricanes. Every single one of them, just about, was on purpose. And then during all that time, I have never had a major problem. Knock on plastic. It's my plastic table. Joke there. Um, why? Because I've generally been prepared. Part of it's because I'm very lucky as well, certainly. You don't want to get too confident, right? Some of it's luck. But luck favors the prepared. Yeah, see, there's the statement there. I love saying that. And it's true. So here's a few thoughts regarding preparedness. You know, people are telling you, busy hurricane season's coming. You know, what do we do about it? Well, you got to be prepared. It's both mentally, fiscally, as in your money, and physically. You got to be able to physically do these different things. Hurricane Center gives you a great bunch of resources. Here are some simple concepts to keep in mind. You determine your risk, develop an evacuation plan based off that risk, get your kit together, you know, whatever that means for you. Check on your insurance, seriously. That has got to be the number one biggest headache right there. And I don't want to knock the insurance industry. We're not here to slam anybody. But the people that I have met throughout my career, especially these last few years, <clears throat> like Michael and Laura, that, that what they've dealt with, I mean, the insurance thing is just a nightmare. And so it is so uber important for you, I like that word, uber, uh, to get an insurance checkup. If you can, call your agent. Find out how hard is it. I want you to do that. Say, hey, agent, whatever their name is. How hard is it for me to file a claim if there's a hurricane that causes damage? What are my roadblocks going to be? What can I do to make it easier should I need to file a claim? Get that done now if you can. If you don't have home, homeowner's insurance, maybe you're a college student or, or whatever, you don't own a home yet, get renter's insurance. Seriously, it's cheap and it helps you, but you got to know what you're getting into and you got to know who to talk to when the time comes. Strengthen your home in whatever capacity you can, whether it be real storm shutters. You know, plywood is expensive these days, my goodness. Uh, so you might as well just buy real storm shutters. You know, check up on your neighbors. Find out in your area who has a generator. Who do I need to help? Who might need my help? Who could help us? Who's the resident hurricane expert on my block? Figure all that out. There's a lot of neighbor apps these days where you can share this kind of information. Homeowner associations. You know, we've done so much on social media, but, you know, getting out in the real world, IRL in real life, 
talk to your neighbors, develop a neighborhood plan, because I'm going to tell you something, once it's all said and done, if your neighborhood is wrecked, whatever that might mean, you know, slightly to major wrecked, you're going to want to work together as a neighborhood to help each other and, you know, keep the bad guys out, that kind of stuff. So trust me, working with your neighbors is a good idea. And then develop a written plan. I know that sounds like, oh yeah, sure, we're not going to do that. But you know what? Everybody's got a smartphone and you have some kind of a little notes program in there. You can just dictate it. You know, all right, I'm going to go to Aunt Helen's house uh, for evacuation. You know, whatever. Make notes. You don't have to sit and type and you don't have to write stuff down and be all labor intensive. You can cheat and use your smartphone to dictate your plan. What's your plan going to be? It could be very simple and it could be very complex depending on your situation. All right, but preparedness is a state of mind. You got to embrace it. And, you know, again, let me just say this. And this is the whole education process that I try to bring to you. Don't think of all of this as bad news. Doom and gloom. Hurricanes are four-letter words. It's just part of nature. It's part of science. Nature is neither good nor bad. It just is. It's not against us. It's not man versus nature. I know that sells movies and documentaries, and that's a neat way to kind of frame things up. But we all are out here together. We should be as much in harmony with nature as we can be. And I know that sounds like, oh, come on. But seriously, this is not us versus them, us versus the hurricanes. We're smart. Let's use our smartness and what we've learned from the past and make good decisions and be ready for the hurricanes. All right, it's that simple. And yes, when they are really, really bad, like we saw last year with Laura, in some areas Laura wiped out the coastline, or Katrina, or Michael, some of them are doomsday. They're horrible. But the rest we can deal with with simple common sense and a little bit of preparation. Speaking of preparation, our good buddy CJ put together this graphic. Some states do this, some don't. I don't know why all don't. I mean, it, it's just a good way to motivate uh, people to get ready. Florida has a hurricane preparedness tax-free holiday from now, actually on May 28th through June 6th. Flashlights, radios, tarps, coolers, you know, you can't go out and hoard a bunch of stuff for cheap, saving on the taxes, and then go sell it on eBay or Amazon. doesn't work that way. So there's just different limitations and price points, etc. But, yeah, you know, take advantage of it. If you need these items, now's a good time to do it. You save a little bit of money on the taxes. So just little things like that. Keep an eye on it for your area. Some states, like I said, do it. Some don't. It, w it would be nice if it was like a national thing. All right, so once the hurricanes get going, house is falling apart. Once the hurricanes get go, that's, that's what I'm talking about. You're in your house, you're home, you never know what's going to happen. you got to be prepared. I can't be prepared for everything, and somebody's knocking my wall down. Um, the joys of doing this in the home office. When we do have live coverage in our field missions, what are we going to do? That is the backbone of why I got into this in the first place. I have this drive, this passion, this desire to study hurricanes up close and personal. Learn more about them, not just with our eyes, but with instruments, with cameras, with anemometers, pressure sensors. You know, understand what we're dealing with, document it, tell the story, help people understand for the future. That is what we do in our live field mission coverage based work. And one of our biggest tools are these cameras here, these little unmanned cameras that have evolved over the years from large trunk sized you know, boxes that had a big battery and a laptop that had to run everything. Now it's all small little Nest cameras that we put in there. We use Verizon hotspots to stream the uh, data, the video and the data. Uh, and we can put these practically anywhere. And, you know, a lot of you already know this. I'm just kind of recapping it for you. Uh, we have about 20 of these for this year that we can put out. Going to be absolutely remarkable. There's what it looked like when we were packing up for probably Delta or something last year. Uh, the rental truck that I had loaded for bear. All kinds of stuff. The anemometers in the back. We have three of these this year. We had two last year. We have three of these complete weather stations this year. Thanks to our crowdfunding, I'm very excited about that. So yeah, our field mission stuff 
Very, very important. There's Brent and Mike, and we were setting up for Hurricane Laura. By the way, this is the one that was cited, C-I-T-E-D, cited, you know, when you cite something, in the Laura post analysis from the National Hurricane Center. That's that anemometer that was mentioned by name. My name was in the report. Um, I wish they had used the other data, but that's a story for another day. But that's what it looks like. We anchor these things down. It's rock solid. That is the Sabine Pass there. Louisiana is behind Brent and Mike. Texas is where I am, basically, uh, on the other side of the Sabine River there. That was set up for Hurricane Laura. Wind data, pressure data, that's what we want to gather and stream it in real time with our camera systems for you to be able to see. How do we do that? We do that through this amazing tracking map system, and I'm going to show you this in more detail in just a minute. This is what it looked like last year. I think this was for uh, Delta, perhaps. It might have been for Laura. I can't remember, so forgive me. But this is what it looks like, our little interface. And there were so many last year. This is our interface online, and it's really, really amazing. As an example, just to give you a little bit of history, this is what it looks like when we set up one of these GoPro cameras that augments our live camera. This is Michael. Brent and I were getting things set up. He takes the camera around. I do. He sets it up on the pole for me with a ratchet strap. The famous Hurricane Michael Mexico Beach footage. This is the exact moment that we were setting everything up back in 2018. This was October the 10th, about two hours before Michael made landfall. We got everything set up. It was time for us to leave. We got out of there eventually. Hold on. Oh, yeah, that's right. We had to check everything. <laughs> I remember that. Making sure everything's working, and off we go. We left the camera box there. And you remember, the outcome was absolutely incredible. Mute this. Skip ahead a little bit. Category 5 conditions. Storm surge coming in after the wind ramped up. It was just an incredible event. And that is what we do with these live cameras and the GoPros as our backups. Because sometimes uh, the live cameras will go down. Verizon's great, but they're not invincible. And the network, the terrestrial network, as it is called, will go bye-bye for a few days. The fiber gets cut. The towers get interrupted. Microwave transmitters get dis displaced. There's a lot of things that can go wrong. So we have these GoPro cameras right here, right there, Hero 4, that backs up everything. We have like a 400 gigabyte chip in here. And then we figured out a way to power these, which I can't tell you about, for three or four days if we want to little secret that we came up with, little little reverse engineering that we went and undertook with these GoPros. And that's the result, is we were able to capture video that you just couldn't capture any other way. And you can see the results there as the time progressed. Really remarkable. Finally, the sun's going down. These GoPros, these cameras, kind of act like what we call these silent sentries. You know how a sentry, S-E-N-T-R-Y, a sentry, like they man their post, a military term. That's what these are. These are silent sentries. They just watch like a watchdog. And they have seen some extraordinary things over the last 16 years since I came up with this concept way back in 2005. Look at that. Amazing. All right. So that's what the cameras do, the instruments do. We also have this really, really neat project the High Altitude Hurricane Balloon, or Herbie as we call it, a really cool concept that I came up with in conjunction with some of my colleagues nine, ten years ago now. We've been practicing it for nine years. We've launched it one time in the eye of a hurricane. That's what it's for, in case you didn't know. I guess I should preface that uh, part of this presentation. What's the goal? Well, we want to launch it into the eye of a hurricane. It being this payload right here, two GoPro cameras, a weather sensor, acts like a sounding device uh, recording data every six seconds. That is a 1500 gram balloon, very big balloon that lifts the payload high into the atmosphere. And the idea is to put this 100,000 feet up above the eye of the hurricane, collecting the data from the surface of the earth to the stratosphere. The balloon bursts when it reaches a certain pressure. It gets so big from the low air pressure, it pops, the payload comes back down. That's the payload again, Herbie. 
high altitude hurricane research balloon and we go and pick it up using amateur radio beacon or satellite tracking we hopefully get the data get the video and have something absolutely incredible that nobody's ever done before well we did it once during Nate in 2017 but that was at one o'clock in the morning the data part worked the video worked but you couldn't see anything because it was one o'clock in the morning we just had to do it it moved over Biloxi the eye of category one Nate it was safe to do so so we did it we got it back and that's on the documentary by the way tracking the hurricanes 2017 on YouTube look it up it's there the other part of this is the ability to do 360 video All right. This is a test we just did recently, and you can move the camera, view around. There's one of our live cams that was watching it. Pretty neat stuff here. This is a test that we just did recently with a different payload design that Brent came up with. There's Brent there with the balloon. He's one of our crowdfunding supporters. Here's him getting ready to launch it. And this was near Calumet, Oklahoma. I know I showed you this recently on another video, but I wanted to show you again in case you're new. Um, we're going to try to do the 360 cam in addition to the regular GoPro Hero 4 cam. And this is what it looks like once it launches. It's pretty cool. Look at that. It's like you're riding along with it. Go full screen. Pretty, pretty cool stuff. Can you imagine this in the eye of a hurricane? It's got to go up a lot faster, though. We've got to send it up at about 1,100 feet per second to get it into the eye of a hurricane up into the stratosphere. The balloon keeps going. Pretty neat nice and stable can look up into the eye when we do this in a hurricane look down at the ground yep gonna be phenomenal so we're looking forward to doing that that's the Herbie project all right the other part of all of this is of course through the website where it all started way back in 1999 hurricane track.com that is the portal that's kind of like the brand the hurricane track brand that's what the logo is all about see it there that's it. That's the brand, Hurricane Track, HurricaneTrack.com is the website. And that's where it all starts. I put, I don't do blogs anymore. It's just almost like redundant to write up a long blog when I'm going to do a video every day. So I, I, I embed my Twitter feed, <clears throat> if I can speak. I embed my Twitter feed on here. It's got my latest video. Um, you know, real simple, just a sort of a stopping point for everything else. And the biggest part of that everything else is this Hurricane Track Insider right here. And this is where our crowdfunding folks really get the reward for their crowdfunding. The Hurricane Track Insider page, that's all part of our um, live coverage. These are all the people that support it. We have a chat that's exclusive for them. All of our videos are on here on the home page. This is kind of our landing page. Then we have the live cams. And this is so neat. You can just click on one of these and they show up so cool um, these are our permanent cameras by the way and some of them are slower because of the the nest system we have our map I showed you that earlier a little screenshot from it these are some of our supporters cameras around the country again sometimes the nest makes me look bad because it takes forever let's try this one out in Colorado come on there you go thank you <laughs> recording live it's always fun Anyway, these are our live cameras that we have permanently during a mission. This map, this interactive map that we've got, you know, the coastline will be dotted with these things. And I don't mean to pick on Louisiana. I'm just kind of showing you as an example. We could put a whole bunch out, inland, whatever, and it's just this big network of live cams. And this is what they look like. These are the permanent cams. This is one down in Freeport, Texas, at Wendy and Michael's Place. This is another one over in Victoria. Yep. Oh, this one's turned off, so I guess i got to remove that one. But you get the idea. A really neat interactive system. Even some cameras permanently featured down in the Caribbean. This is in San Juan, Puerto Rico at Carlos' apartment. And Nest is going to be slow again. St. Thomas down in the Virgin Islands. Hey, look at that. Beautiful. This is all part of our website. HurricaneTrack.com, our insider site, the tracking map really really neat stuff and it's all part of the crowdfunding aspect I don't want to just come in and say hey guess what we need some funding to do what we're gonna what we're gonna do without giving you something in return and the return is what I just showed you and this is how we do it through patreon and our hurricane track insider site we connect the two what is patreon you hear me talk about that every once in a while 
Well, it is a website and an app, it's both, that allows people, fans like you, to support creators like me. And it could be musicians, filmmakers, poets, gamers, you know, Twitch is big with Patreon, YouTube. It's a growing thing. People know crowdfunding these days. But it's also a way, like I said, to invest in the future there. Crowdfunding the future of the work. We have over 600 people on Patreon from all around the world that are helping to make this happen through their membership level, their pledge level each month. It begins at 10 bucks a month. You get access to all the stuff I just showed you, uh, all the way up to $25 and more, depending on your level, whatever you can afford. But the bottom line, though, the reward is not just access, you know, from HurricaneTrack.com to the Insider site to the tracking map and the live cams. You become part of the whole process. You understand? We do Zoom meetings for one of our tier levels. We work with each other. We text each other. We, we're all actively involved together. It's not just a subscription service where I provide a product, you pay a fee. It's a lot different than that, and that's how we do it through Patreon. So if you want to get involved, it's patreon.com slash hurricane track. The $10 level is the entry. I'm no longer doing the $1 level. It's just we're beyond that, and there's nothing that I can offer. You know what I mean? It's like it's worth 10 bucks a month. It is, and it's limited, though. We only have 293 left. We only have 46 left of the $25 level because, believe it or not, I don't want it to get too big and then it can't be as personal as I'd like it to be. As an example, these people here on the chat, I know some of these people. We talk with each other. We chat with each other. If there's 10,000 people on there, yes, it would provide a lot of funding. Sure, that would be great, but, I mean, come on. That would get out of control. I wouldn't be able to handle it, so we try to limit it uh, with these numbers here. So, yep, there's only less than 300 for the $10 level. 46 for the $25 level, which includes these Zoom meetings that we do, like I mentioned. So check it out. Get involved. That's how you do so. Where are the people from that help us? I wanted to mention this for a while. I finally get a chance to do that today. Kind of created a little global map here. All of these people are actively involved. You have Tim Melman, uh, who is going to be a senior in high school from the Chicago area. C.J. Morgan, 24-year-old from down in the Sarasota area, and he helps out. He's one of our patrons and does a lot of the anchoring of the live streams now. You'll see CJ in person. Mike Cornelius also runs FL Hurricane or Central Florida Hurricane Center, flhurricane.com, and he's in the Orlando area. Me, Mark Suddeth, you know me, I'm in Wilmington. Brent Lynn, he's down in the Virgin Islands in St. John. He's not only one of our highest level of patrons, but he also creates the PDF files of our reports, our missions that we do. He compiles the data and puts those together for us. And then way over across the pond, in the Atl across the Atlantic in the UK, we have Will Woodgate, who designed this tracking map. Where is it? Right here, from scratch. I gave him the idea, and look, it's actually tracking that tropical depression in the Pacific. Uh, but yes, he uh, designed this map for me last year during the pandemic during the lockdown he said look i'm a patron i support what you do i love what you do by the way i can do coding what would you like what what if you could do anything you want what would it be and he designed that map for me so will is over there in the uk kari Lindsay also in the uk kari does these graphics like that one and that one tim melman did this one so we have kari over in the uk that helps out producing my thumbnails for me, and we really appreciate that. Hopefully, we can all get together one year in the United States and have a big celebration of patrons and the back-end people. It's just extraordinary. The world of the Internet, you know, the Internet can be fraught with danger and negativity and just a bunch of BS, but if you can get past that, it's amazing. These are real people, some of which I've never met. You know, I haven't met Kari or Will in person. I haven't met um, Tim yet uh, but I will and we'll all get together one day and just celebrate this amazing thing that we've got through crowdfunding the crowdsourcing of ideas it's absolutely incredible so a big thank you to the back end team a big thank you to all the patrons on here 
that have helped me out not only this year, but since I've done Patreon, going back to 2016, and then all the way back 16 years ago when I started the whole idea of crowdfunding the future of this work with the first live cameras back in 2005. All right, as I wrap things up, I want to promote this. Our podcast is called Hurricane Season, the podcast. It's free. It's available wherever you get your podcasts. It is like a little daily morning digest that's very short in contradiction and in contrast to this video. The podcast is very, very short. Each and every morning on Spotify, Apple, Google, wherever, you got an RSS feed, the whole bit. Um, Hurricane Season, the podcast, I give you an idea of what I'm looking at for that day on an audio podcast, and then I do the Hurricane Outlook and Discussion video that afternoon. You know, you understand? So the podcast sets the tone, and then later in the day, I do the, the more longer 15, 20-minute video. And the video, of course, is on YouTube. All right, as I wrap it up, finally, connect and follow. The main social media that I am on is Twitter, at Hurricane Track, Facebook, it's all Hurricane Track, facebook.com slash Hurricane Track. YouTube has grown substantially over the last four years or so. I've been on YouTube since 2006, believe it or not, but it's only been since about 2017 that it really skyrocketed to the roughly 33,000 subscribers that I have now. And everybody is equally important. I mean, without you, there's no reason for me, seriously. But I do like to see things grow. I like to have a bigger audience. It's not for my ego. It is for being able to share this joy of studying the weather and especially hurricanes. Hurricanes are my forte, yes. But other weather, we're getting out into it more. Severe weather, nor'easters, lake effect snow, the monsoon. I want to be able to share more and more of that with you. And we can do it live. And we can do it in ways that nobody else can. And it's because of the crowdfunding. It's because of this group of people that all get together around this collective campfire that we call the Internet. So follow on these different sites, subscribe on YouTube, share, you know, tell people. You know weather geeks, tell them about what I do, what we do collectively. It's a group of us. I might be the lead singer of the band, so to speak, but it's because of all of you all, again, around that campfire that I talked about that we call the Internet, that I'm able to do this. And I thank you for that uh, very, very much. It's great to have you. Some of you I've known, by the way, since I started this way back in 1999, the whole HurricaneTrack.com thing. Some of you I've just met in recent years, and many of you in between, and it's just all been very remarkable. And I look forward to doing what I do and having you along for the ride. All right, uh, any other parting thoughts that I can think of? Basically, as I sort of sum this up, don't fear the hurricane season. And that might be easy for me to say, but you fear what you don't understand. It is my job to help you understand what we're going to be up against and better yet, what you can do about it to the best of your ability. There will be cases where something will come along that is going to change your life potentially. Yes. And we have to be ready for that, at least mentally up here. How do you wrap your brain around the fact that you could lose your entire house? You have to be ready for that. You can't just ignore it and say, I hate hurricane season, I hate thinking about it, that is not going to solve any problems. So as we get ready for the 2021 season, 21 is right, 2021, just think of it as we're blessed with all of these tools to know what's coming. Different than an earthquake, different than most tornadoes that only give us minutes, hurricanes give us days, and in some case, cases, maybe a couple of weeks. And that, my friends, is a good thing. And so let's think of it positive, not negative, not hype, not doomsday, not doom and gloom, but science. Science is the basis of what we do. We are crowdfunded. We are science-based, and it's awesome to have you with us again for another hurricane season. If you need anything from me, you got questions, my email there at the end of this presentation, I'll put it up one more time. Send me an email, hermark at gmail.com. Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, comments, whatever. I try to respond to as much as I can. It's great to have you along with me again for another year. I am Mark Suttoff. I'm here for you. Let's make it happen together. Thanks for watching. I'll be back tomorrow, June 1st, the first of the Hurricane Outlook and Discussions for the official start of the 2021 season. 
I will see you then. Thanks for watching.